Hey, how's it going guys? I'm Ryuz and welcome back to my channel. I hope you are doing well. Before we start, I just want to apologize for not posting any video for the last two weeks. I'm in a really bad place right now and I still need to sort stuff out in order for me to get back to my usual pace. I can't really explain all of it right now because it will take too long. But once I got my shit together, I will definitely let you guys know. So anyways, for this week's video, I'm thinking of showing you guys my build of Kyonshi Imoto. I think I bought Kyonshi Imoto at the perfect time because her evolve got buffed a few weeks ago. It makes her really powerful in late game. She can pretty much end your opponent by herself if you get into the late game. I'm not even joking, her end game burst is that strong. So without further ado, let's jump into the deck rundown, shall we? This deck is a mid-range deck but really shines once you reach level 3. The other build that uses Umibozu is easier to use and has higher power in endgame, but you have to use Umibozu's SSR that no one really uses other than in very specific decks. And this is the top 5 meta decks on the Chinese server before the new pack drops. You can see that Kyonchi Imoto is number 2 because it is really strong. So first up, we have Awandon. She is the extender of this deck because this deck really needs that one extra orb to fully optimize your play. For her, I'm bringing two ghost stories. If Bukuman draw wasn't enough, this will get you exactly what card you need. Then we have one Phantom Flame. This card got buffed recently and I would consider to bring this as an emergency option if Awandon is your only attacker. Then we have two Enlightenment. Since our true power is in late game, this this will increase our pace. Then we have two Fire of Tails. Generating extra orbs every turn is crucial for this deck. So of course this is a two off. And then we have one Evolve. This will make your late game play even more explosive because you can get up to four orbs every turn. Then we have Bukuman as our draw source. We mainly bring him for the ink splash and scroll of everything. For him, I'm bringing one explorer of the worlds. Frankly, this card is mostly used just to keep Bukuman alive in early game and as a blocker. Of course, you can replace this with his level 2 form if you want more consistency. Then we have one wonder. This is a card game, so of course there will be times where your hand will look like dog shit. So the ability to redraw your hand is always nice. Then we have two, a new page. Drawing two cards is always nice in any card game. Then we have two, Ink Splash. This card can easily deal 5 to 6 damage. That's usually enough to kill any Shigami mid game. Then we have two, Scroll of Everything. Getting extra card from outside your deck for your every Shigami is really good. Especially useful for Imoto and Gaki since they have really powerful cards. And then we have our main hitter, Kyonshi Imoto. She's not exactly a newbie friendly Shikigami since it requires you to complete Kaidan missions and pay 280 golds which is not a small amount. But if you have the money, by all means try to get her because she is really powerful now. For her, I'm bringing two baddies begun. Kyoshi Emoto has a pretty good base stats but you'll most likely want to use this after you evolve her because a 9 attack Shikigami with piercing is guaranteed to run over almost any Shikigami. Then we have one sit. We don't really want to bring too many cards that buffs tomato because in the end, Imoto will turn into a tomato with plus 3 stats anyway. Then we have one stay away, just in case you need an emergency blocker or attacker. You don't really need to pay attention to the trigger effect because that rarely comes up. Then we have two attack. Before you evolve Imoto, try to activate at least one of these because it will help you deal more damage to the opponent. And if you manage to activate two of this, it's pretty much over for the opponent's Shigami because Imoto will deal a lot of damage. Then we have two Evolve. This is what makes Kyonshi Imoto really powerful because she will turn into Tomato and on activation we also get two random combat cards. And Kyonshi Imoto has really powerful combat cards. And lastly we have Gaki as our secondary damage dealer and board control. For her, I'm bringing two eat what you can. Since there's more field Shikigami than shield Shikigami, this is better than the other combat card. If they didn't use either, you can just treat this as a vanilla combat card. Then we have two devour. Form cards are getting more and more powerful, so this card will always be useful to control your opponent. Then we have one satiated. This card is 
really simple and has high stats. And since it has Veiled, you don't really have to worry about her getting sniped. Then we have one Evolve. Newer Shikigami rarely has permanent stats boost, so this card rarely comes up, but if they use Shikigami that has a permanent stat boost, erasing that stats boost feels really good. Then we have Aftertaste. You only want to use this when, you, when you're either really low on health or when you have her SSR in hand. Lastly, we have the SSR. This card is pretty difficult to use because you need to remove at least 3 buffs to really feel the power. This deck is pretty weak against really aggressive deck like Fragile Aggro or decks that has really high power early game like Greenleaf Ungaikyo. But if you can drag out the battle, you can definitely have a chance to turn the match around. And that's about it for the deck rundown, so let's move on with the replays. Our first battle is up against Higan Ashura. Some people will have their own favorite Shigami and will always try to make them work no matter how bad they are. And I have nothing but respect for those people. Well, anyway, since we're fighting against Agro, if we can drag this long enough, we can pretty easily end them. They get the first turn, that's fine since this deck doesn't really care if we get first or second. They will put Vampira forward and pass. For our first turn, we always want to level up Awandon first and leave one orb so that we can get the lantern support. Because this deck really needs that extra move every turn. And by placing a 4 attack tomato, they will need to waste a card to get rid of it or second sacrifice Vampira. On their turn, they will evolve Higanbana and as expected, they will sacrifice Vampira because they want Ashura to attack next turn or they have Ashura's form that they want to use. On our turn, we put Phantom Flame on Awandon, then use her to attack directly. I know I said that we need extra orbs, but by doing this, even if they manage to get over her, Ashura will take quite a bit of damage. On their turn, they will put a form on Ashura, then attack with him. See. He managed to kill Awandon, but that leaves his Ashura with just 2 health left. On our turn, while it is really tempting to eat the form with Gaki, it is better to use Ink Splash to kill Ashura, because Ashura has a base 6 health, and Gaki's card will not kill him. We'll save the Vower for their other Shikigami. On their turn, they will evolve Hangan, then use Higanbana to kill our Bukuman and pass. This means they're willing to throw out Higanbana because they don't have her cards that they can use. So on our turn, we activate attack to summon tomato. While activating 2 in 1 turn is tempting, I would save the other one for when Vampira revives. We will take the damage because of Hangan's evolve, but that's fine. On their turn, they will just attack with Vampira and pass. They're being really passive because their main offensive option is down. On our turn, we activate another attack and because we activated 2, Hangan and them will take 3 damage each. And with that, we just completely shut down their deck. On their turn, they will evolve Ashura that will also kill our tomato. Huh, I never knew it has 3 projectile and they will deal 4 damage to us. On our turn, we will evolve Gaki, put Satiated on her, activate one Lantern support, and kill their Ashura. From this point on, it will be just smooth sailing because there's no way they can turn this around. On their turn, they activate Crumbling Abyss. If this was full power Ashura, I'd shitting my pants, but fortunately, it's not, so he will die again. Then they activate Deadly Bloom to kill our Kyonchi Imoto. Well, that's unfortunate, but we still have our backup plan. On our turn, we activate Scroll of Everything. Then activate Eat What You Can and attack one more time with Gaki to end the game. Our second match is up against Taishak Ted Control. This matchup is pretty easy to deal with because we have Gaki. We mainly want to shut down Taishakuten when he puts Holy Child. We can leave Bukuman and Yoko alone. I guess Tamamo is dangerous once we reach level 3 but we can finish them off too in level 3. We get the first turn this time and as I said previously, we just want to level up Awandon and pass. On their turn, they will put the Holy King on Taishakuten and Explorer of the Worlds on Bukuman. Then they will direct attack. Gaki got attached with Lotus but that's fine since we're not going to use her until level 2 anyway. On our turn, we attack with Bukuman, then put Explorer of the Worlds on our Bukuman and pass. Just by putting a 2 stat attacker, this will make them think twice before attacking because their Shikigami has low stats. 
Oh, so they're willing to sacrifice him just to stop us from drawing a card. That's fine, we still have other ways. On our turn, we will kill their Bukuman, then activate Ghost Stories. We get to search two cards because our Bukuman has haste. We take Gaki's Evolve and Devour and pass. On their turn, they will activate another The Falling, then put Destin 1 on Yoko. After that, they will activate Key Focus, they land Blood Check, and that will kill our Bookman. On our turn, since our Shigami is low on health, we need to deal as much damage as we can before they can finish them off. We activate Attack and use Tomato to deal damage to their life, and Taishak 10, and we pass. On their turn, they will activate Fox Fire to kill our Tomato, then activate Windblade to kill our Awanor. As expected, the Lotus will move to Emoto. That's fine since we only need her once we reach level 3 later. They will attack with Yoko and pass. On our turn, since they didn't put Holy Child, that means we can just use our Devour on Yoko to kill him. Then attack with Gaki to deal 3 damage and pass. On their turn, they top deck Holy Child. Then activate Soul Strike on Gaki. That will also kill Imoto and they will pass. They are really lucky with that top deck. Really lucky. On our turn, thankfully we have Ink Splash, that will be enough to kill their Taishak 10. Then we activate a new page to draw two cards, to draw two cards. We have Wonder, so might as well use it. We don't need two Gaki Combat Card and two Emoto Evolve, so we'll switch those out and pass. On their turn, they will just attack with Bukuman and pass. This is the problem with Taishakuten control. Once we kill Taishakuten, their stuff just stops working. On our turn, we will use Ink Splash to kill their Tamamo, then evolve Awandon. After that, since we have her form, we activate Lantern Sport, then put Fire of Tails. With this, we're guaranteed to have 4 orbs next turn. On their turn, they will activate Scroll of Everything. Then a new page, and finally attack. It seems like even after adding that much card, they still can't do anything. That's actually hilarious. Well, it's time to wrap this up. We're going to evolve Imoto. Activate the piercing combat card to get rid of Bukuman. Then we basically use the rest of her combat cards to completely annihilate them. Well, that's all for today's video, I certainly hope you enjoyed it. Once again, I'm sorry I still can't upload like usual until I finish sorting out my problems, so I can't ask you to support me on Patreon or, or Ko-Fi since I'm not providing you guys the contents that you're looking for. But I still look forward to your comments as usual. See you guys on the next video. Bye!